And so I want to look uh, again at our, our, uh, our study that we're going through with the, the book called The American Covenant, The Untold Story. That word covenant is key. We keep coming back to it. Our, our 100-day plan, today we're on day 34 of our 100-day plan, is to uh, return to the covenants of our forefathers, which is a sacred promise that has far-reaching and lasting effects on our relationship with God and his relationship with us and our families and our nation. And we've talked about the pilgrims and how they, they were miraculously delivered from impossible situations as they crossed the Atlantic Ocean as this little floating republic, this little group of, of uh, churchgoers who were praising God and singing hymns, no doubt, wondering what plans God had for them in this new world. And when they landed there, they understood that their ability to, to, to have peace with God and peace with one another and peace with the, the people that they would meet in this new land was going to be essential for them to be able to survive. And so they, they drafted their political document, the Mayflower Compact. We talked all about that. And um, this is today talking about uh, something really important. They understood because they were told by their minister that in the difficult days that they would face after landing that very first winter, it would be their, their own personal integrity. It would be their Christian self-government and their strong bonds with one another that would save them. If they lost any of those three things, they were done. It was their ability to self-govern. It was their strong character. And it was their bonds with one another that would save them. And they learned these things in their family of faith. They learned this in their house of worship. They learned this from their minister who taught them the timeless truths of God's word. And it was these principles that in fact did caused them to have healthy politics and it saved their lives during trouble. During the disastrous first winter, when over half of them died, it was an incredibly difficult situation. Half of them died. But interestingly, even though it was so difficult, While the Mayflower returned back to England, none of the pilgrims did. They stayed. They essentially burned their ships. They said, we're not going back because we believe that our cause is just and God is going to help us. And we have all the tools we need to make it in this wilderness and turn it into a paradise by the the strength of God. This This is amazing stuff. But here was their big problem. When the springtime came and they began to plant their crops and they began to live and they built their houses on the, on the land that they, that they had settled, they were in this deal with those who had paid for their trip. The, the, the merchants who had paid for their trip to come to the new world had made this deal with them. And the deal was that the merchants owned half of everything that they had, half of their land, owned their, their houses, and everything that they had worked for, all their plants that they had, uh, the crops that they had planted, Ultimately, not only did did, did the merchants back in England own half of all that stuff, so they only got to really take advantage of and use to survive on half of the stuff that that, that they grew, but they also were were forced to put it into a, a community pot where everyone was then able to take from it. So in essence, everybody was supposed to work, and the idea was you put it into the community pot, and then it would be distributed to everybody. Only you can imagine what happened. There were some people who worked hard and some people who were lazy. And the people who were lazy ended up getting the stuff that was produced by those who worked hard. And so with not everybody working hard, there wasn't as much being produced. Half of it uh, was, was not even theirs to begin with. And what was left was distributed to people who didn't even work for it. So... It, 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 you had reduced productivity. And even the people who were willing to work hard felt like, what's the point? I mean, these people over here who are not even working are just taking what I've worked for and now I can't even feed my family and I certainly can't help my neighbor who's sick and is not able to work because there are people over here who are scamming the system. 
What does that sound like? F sound familiar? Yeah. This whole community thing, this whole partnership thing, this whole common store thing, this whole joint property thing was not working out for them. And they were like, forget this. We need to buy our own land. We, we, we're working so hard, we're risking our lives and, and, and we're giving the profits away to other people. Not even the profits, but the stuff we have to live on. And we're giving it to people who, who are not even willing to work, they're scamming the system. We need to buy our houses, buy our property, and we need to change because this socialism stuff sucks. Pardon my French or my pilgrimese, but this was not working out. And they understood that they were never gonna make it. And the only people who were gonna really lose and pay the price was them and their kids. And so they said, forget this common property stuff, forget this common food and money stuff. We need to change this and motivate people to work hard and self-govern. And so when the first governor had passed away, they elected William Bradford. And at 30 years old, he became the governor of the Pilgrims. Imagine that responsibility at only 30 years old. The future of the United States of America is really resting on you and your wisdom. He didn't know that. But essentially, they laid down the, the template and the pattern and his wisdom was what, what, what really guided them through. And listen to what he said. William Bradford, Bradford said this, he said, after much debate of things, the governor, with the advice of the chiefest among them, gave way that they should set corn every man for his own particular family. Every man needs to plant corn for his own family. In other words, if you don't work, you don't eat. That's a biblical concept in the book of Proverbs. If you don't eat, you don't work. The lazy man who just folds his hands and sleeps will come to ruin and poverty. And in that regard to trust themselves, self-government. Ultimately, they're trusting in God, but they're trusting in God to bless them as they govern themselves and provide for their own families. And he, here's what happened. The governor gave a plot of land to each family. Here's your plot. You get a plot of land and you get to work that land. And whatever comes off that land, your family gets to eat it. So guess what happened? It made everybody start to work hard. All of a sudden they were motivated. And, and, and they had, quote, they had very good success for it made all hands very industrious. <laughs> Imagine that. You don't work, you don't eat. Everybody starts working. Everybody starts producing all kinds of stuff. That's good advice. And he said, from then on, there was never again a famine in Plymouth. There was no lack of food because everybody made enough. In fact, you made so much, you had more than enough for yourself and your family. You were able to give to those who were not able to work. Maybe they were sick. Maybe they, 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 they had something that kept them from working hard, even though they wanted to work hard. And he said, the experience that, was, that we had in this common course. Now, now, now understand this, this is coming from Bradford's journal. He said, we experienced this. This isn't some theory from some ivory tower. This isn't some philosopher who's saying how we ought to do things. We experienced this in a wilderness coming out of a winter where more than half of us died. And if this doesn't work, we're gonna perish. He said, the experience that we had in this common course and condition tried many years. So they actually worked this out for many years. It wasn't a fluke the first year. And that among godly and sober men. So we did this with godly and sober men. These weren't a bunch of retrobate uh, drunks. These were people who really loved God and were serious minded about things. And this may well evidence the vanity and the conceit, the stupidness and the arrogance of Plato and other ancients. He was Bradford. The pilgrims were calling out Plato. They were calling him out and saying, this is bull. This is stupidity and this is arrogance. What was? Well, that, that their belief that the taking away of private property and bringing in community or communism would make people happy and flourishing. That's what they thought. They taught that, no, 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 don't, don't take away people's private property and give it all to one big uh, common pot and then everybody will be happy and flourishing. He says, no, as though they were wiser than God. He's saying those ideas of socialism, communism, Plato's ideas were, 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 were wrong because they thought they were wiser than God, i.e. God's principles contrast that sharply. And it's true. Uh, namely the 8th and the 10th commandment. The 8th commandment is you shall not steal. 
when you forcibly take property that belongs to other people in the name of giving it to other people who are not working for it, that essentially is government-sanctioned theft. The Eighth Commandment, you shall not steal. And then you have the Tenth Commandment, you shall not covet. The whole premise that you get people to go along with that is, hey, that guy's got more than you have. Don't you want that? Yeah, and you begin to covet what that guy has because he's got more than you. Maybe it's because he worked harder. Maybe it's because he had initiative and creativity and he, 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 he uh, got other people to join and they worked hard and they flourished and they're, and they're prospering. Unlike you who might be sitting there folding your hands and sleeping, waiting for someone to do the work for you. So God is against and hates this idea uh, that, that is commonly known as socialism and communism. It's destroyed by the eighth and the 10th commandment. For this community was found to breed much confusion, the governor of the pilgrims said, and discontent. It made everybody confused and it made them very unhappy. And to retard, to slow, to discourage much employment that would have been to their benefit and comfort. It actually made them stop working. It made them just get lazier. That instead of working hard, which would have benefited them and made them more prosperous. He understood that through experience of many years with wise, hardworking, thinking men and women. You work hard, you get blessing. That's what we uh, need today. And what that did is it challenged their, their principles of self-government because they knew, man, if we, don't, if we don't step up, if we don't lean in and work hard and, tr and, pr and trust God and do the right thing, even though we got no police here, we're going we're gonna to croak. We're going to perish. The whole thing's going to be done. And he said that this was in sharp contrast with what was going on down in, in Jamestown. Now, Jamestown is also very early beginnings of America. Down in Virginia, that's where they were trying to go, but they got blown off course, right? But down in Virginia, you had good men, you had good people there in the family of faith, but you also had people who were very much there to take advantage of, they were opportunists and, and and you've got that in the heart of men everywhere. There's no location that uh, is free from greed and selfishness. But down in Jamestown, you had a different dynamic going on. And there were people that were looking for external gain. They had heard about the gold and the pearls that supposedly uh, were owned by the, the Native American Indians that were there. And they wanted to go and take those things. They were largely bent, many of them, not all of them, but many of them bent on external wealth rather than the pilgrims who, in sharp contrast, were we're looking for an internal treasure. The freedom to think without being persecuted. The freedom to believe according to the dictates of their conscience. The freedom to worship God without being persecuted and the freedom to have liberty to live and to work and to enjoy the fruit of their, of their labors and provide for their families and in charity to voluntarily help those who are in need. That's real community. It's the opposite, opposite of forced communism. Real community is you and me having character, godly self-government and a strong bond of love between one another. And if we'll do that, God will give us more than enough to be, to be able to take care of one another. Isn't that the principles that our country was built on? Isn't those the kind of principles that you want your kids to live by? I do. And the only way you and I can lead is by example. And we're talking about this on day 34 of our 100 day plan. And these are the principles that we need to begin putting into action if we're not already. We need God to, 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 to sink this stuff deep into our heart and to just sear our minds with these truths. And we need to teach them to our kids. And so thank you for those who are joining us here at the campfire with your kids. I, hear, I read your comments. It's awesome. Some of you, some of you kids are here and now you're calling me the, the, the campfire man. I've seen your crayon drawings that you've been drawing for your kids that your mom and dad have been sending them to me. And I'm so proud of you for being here. You are the hope in the future of our country. You're gonna be the leaders that are gonna be running this whole place when we're gone. And we're counting on you, we love you, and we believe in you because God is with you. See you tomorrow night.